it wouldn't be safe if it got back on the surface and the goby alone wouldn't have a problem and would be exposed. So let, let me show you two, two videos to illustrate the um, illustrate the symbiosis. So this was all filled in Borinar. You can see the shrimp is always touching the goby with its antenna when it's coming out. So here, you know, this is a close-up on the face of the goby. You see that the respiratory movements of the fish. Again, these are these are elongated nostrils, and you see the large eyes of the fish. And they're also in an elevated position on the body of the, of the fish, which is something you see in a lot of animals which live on, on plain surfaces. So, you know, this is a, a cryptocentros, Cebolium uh, macronatus, right? Um, then, the, so what you can see here, the, uh, these gobies just stand as guards on the entrance of these pools. There's not a lot of movement. And, um, um, here, the, yeah, this is a Xenogobius uh, colossus, and again, you know, the, the fish is, is pretty stationary. Um, interesting, and this us later, look at the, these crests around the eyes here. It changes color. This is a four times time lapse. So, uh, I'll talk about the possible function of this later on. Here, look at this is a, a slow motion, it's uh, slowed down 10 times. Here, a piscible predator, a sandwich, and, and uh, the uh, goby very quickly escapes on the ground. And uh, the, yeah, here again, you can, you can see the shrimp digging, and the goby is in this you know, guard position at the entrance, and this is a, um, a social signal that it's, it's showing its uh, males that you know, this, this is my piece of sand. And it's just a change in position. So this is another close-up. Again, you see the respiratory movements. Uh, yeah, this is um, this go. It's also a shrimp go, but this is actually hovering uh, in front of its coral. And uh, this is a species named Myosinia lachneri, which uh, this is a first record for the Philippines. That I found that. And. Um, so uh, let me demonstrate with a second video of this escape reflex. So again, you know, here you see the shrimp digging, and uh, which is uh, this is a rare excursion. So a lot of times these fish do not leave the entrance of the coral very much, and then fast forward a little bit. So, you know, this, this is, so they, are, um, they can tell whether a mid-sized fish is an herbivore or a piscivore, whether it's a danger for them, for large animals, like myself, they always free. So it's actually really difficult to approach them, and this one was very trust, trusty for some reason. So I just decided to test the uh, escape reflex here. And, um, it let me come un uncharacteristically close. And then I just had to go and scared a little bit to, to film the escape. Uh, which I'm going to do in a second. This is in Dawi, this is in Naples. Okay. And the fish, the fish stays underwater for a couple of minutes. And the shrimp was. So, interesting symbiosis. Um, the, Another interesting thing about this symbiosis is this is such a beneficial um, process for these, uh, for both involved parties that uh, this evolved twice. So this is the family tree cladogram of all gobies. And you can see there's a cluster here, the reef shrimp gobies, and these are the seed shrimp gobies. And they are actually they are cousin species to the reef shrimp gobies, which do not live in such a symbiosis. So, so we can assume from this cladogram that uh, there were two evolutionary origins. 
uh, for the system of, of working together between the crustacean and the fish. So you know, we'll come back to that. I think I think this is very um, you know this really tells us how that is relatively for both parties to enter the symbiosis, and on the other hand, the advantages are, are massive. So, you know, the research case. So, this has been investigated t uh, since about the early 1970s, and including uh, Nadia Vesalis, and uh, did a lot of really interesting research about the horror construction, which she was recording now. So, so, there's a good body of work on this uh, symbiosis, but, you know, as, as usual, you, the more you look, the more questions. So I think that there are definitely still a lot of uh, interesting unanswered questions. And uh, what interests us is, um, you know, what's the, what's the trade-off? So like in, in any uh, relationship, business relationship, or personal relationship, there will be a trade-off. So I don't know, maybe your boyfriend gets on your nerves, but he cakes, bakes really good cakes, right? So how, how do you value that? And um, uh, same thing here. You know, so uh, clearly, from the point of view of the goalie, the advantage is this, is this oral provided, which you know provides a you know a massive increase in safety, as opposed to being just exposed on the sandy plane, right, in plain view of these predators. Uh, but you know, uh, what are the investments? And really, I want to talk about two possible investments. So, you know, what are these fish at this point, right? They're, they're visual specialists. Uh, they are they're perched in front of this world. And then their, um, you know, their, their job is to, to look out for oncoming predators. So, and in this case, we are, uh, they are basically they're responsible for the safety of two animals, right? Themselves and for the shrimp, which they're, um, they're keeping, um, you know, in the symbiotic relationship. And um, so, it could be that the visual system of these animals has actually expanded. Uh, role has really expanded when they enter the symbiosis. We, we look at that, and um, so this would be an increased investment. Um, and uh, the other time, it, uh, the other question is: Is there uh, a loss of opportunities? So you know, as you've seen on these videos, which are pretty typically actually for what's happening, the shrimp, the uh, bogies don't move much, uh, and uh, they they would just be in front of this coral and wouldn't. Uh, Standing on guard duty, wouldn't they lose foraging opportunities? Yeah. You know, it's just the same thing if you work as a guard here in front of one of the buildings, you can't just go to McDonald's, right? <laughs> Similar situation. And so, um, let's first talk about the visual system. So, the visual system is a very expensive uh, system in an organism. And then, in flies, a, you know, which if you look at them in a microscope, they have these huge eyes. It's a third, or I believe a third of the energy which they take up goes into the maintenance of just the photosynthesis. So the, the, uh, the visual system, arthropods and the invertebrates, is an extremely powerful detector of light. So there's, there's a less than 10 photons, which is, you know, like a minute amount of energy we can detect. And this detection essentially necessitates that uh, these uh, photoreceptors are always very close to uh, being triggered. And you know that essentially takes a lot of energy to replenish the, uh, the membrane potentials and the uh, neurotransmitters which uh, these cells are using. So it's uh, investing in the, vicious, uh, in the vicious system is no small deal. And um, what's the vicious system? Right, it's the eye, it's the retina, and the there is a visual part of the brain. We're, we're not in a position that we can uh, actually measure, be very hard, uh, measure the energy uh, use of the visual system. But just simply the eye size is a very good proxy. And um, we, so we analyzed that. We used fish base. Anybody familiar with fish base? It's a good resource if you haven't looked at it. Uh, it's, um, a German Filipino collaboration, I think they're based in Filipino um, Spanos. And uh, there's a massive database of 30,000 fish with a lot of uh, parameters for uh, many fish species. And uh, what, we, what we did, we uh, correlated the size of the fish, the length, with the size of the eye of the fish. And then the question was if there's a, a goby, is a shrimp goby? 
what's the relative eye size uh, of that fish would be. Now, uh, what I mean by relative eye size, of course, we can't compare like, a, a large goal in, you know, with a, a minute dwarf goal. So, uh, for size normalized fish, you know, with a one centimeter shrimp goal, we have a lot of large eye than a one centimeter non shrimp goal. Two centimeter shrimp goal, we compare with that. So, we essentially we did a regression both for the shrimps and the shrimp cobies. Not published quite yet, it's available on bio uh, archive. And um, this is the, these are the results, basically. So uh, the solitary cobies are in red, but the shrimp associated cobies are in blue. And this is just, uh, these are the same data, just on the right, they're plotted on a low block scale. And uh, you can see that there is no difference. So the regression lines are pretty much on top of each other. And just, you know, if you just look at these clouds of data points, um, you can see that the So there's no increased investment uh, by shrimp-associated goals in the visual system. What's the reason for that? Okay, uh, I'm speculating here, of course. I think one the reason could be that these uh, sand living goals, which gave rise to the shrimp goals, already had a really powerful visual systems and uh, there was no need to improve the performance anymore. Option number two would be that the symbiosis is relatively new in evolution. This has just not developed. Hard to tell that apart. Look at the total fish length. The minimum here is just, uh, just below a centimeter. So gobies are also among the smallest vertebrate animals. Uh, there's sheet ladia, maybe penis, uh, with an error length of 8 millimeters, which is, is believed to be the, the smallest living world. Quite interesting. Okay. So, change. Oops. Expanded visual system? No. But, you know, second question is there, uh, um, is there an increased investment in guarding? Is there loss of foraging opportunities? So that's a more difficult question. We actually had to go down it, huh? Life is tough. <laughs> okay. So Dan and I would uh, use these uh, plastic scaffolds where we would mount a GoPro camera on uh, this crossbar facing down. In some cases, we also had GoPro cameras at the, at the Gobi level. Um, we would, so this uh, where um, Hero 4 cameras and the battery of these lasts for about an hour. So we would find a shrimp goby, set down the camera, turn it on, and then record. Um, the, uh, then we would leave, as you have seen before, they're not particularly fond of divers looking at them, especially when you go. <laughs> and uh, so we, we would always keep a couple of meters of distance from the gobies and, and we would just let the camera be. Um, we had two sampling sites, so if you're familiar with where now, we, we went to Lucero, which is about 18 meters deep. It's a fairly strong, it's a, a coral reef, a very stressed overfished reef. And then we uh, used Tzilaki, which is the site with the giant camps, which is so it's seagrass, it's a, a, site, a, 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 a seagrass meadow with a, interesting mix of fishes and these giant clams are actually quite uh, interesting in that they provide um, hiding places for big sized fishes. So there was really a much more vibrant fish model this side. And uh, the difference is also because of the clams. So the giant clams are there in two or three meters. And then, so we got these recordings. which essentially looked like this. So, can you see the fish? It's here. The goby is here, and you can see some activity here of the shrimp. And, and we would have per fish, we would have about an hour of recording. And uh, again, you know, pretty lazy fish, very industrious shrimp. And a um, couple of interesting things here. You see, so there's this change in light levels here. One more over. This is called dappling. And this is uh, the effect, of course, of the sunlight breaking on the surface of the 
waste. This is an interesting uh, phenomenon because this is a very strong signal. If you just have a, a signal detection system, you know there will be a lot of uh, power in, in these bands. Somehow the gobies are not, you, you know, like a, uh, they're not constantly escaping from this. So there must be some fit that the gobie visual system to take care of. Yeah, this is um, this is a time lapse recording. So this is sped up five times. You can see how really, really industrious the shrimp is. Yeah, it, interesting. You know, this alpha shrimp they have one claw is much larger than the others. And um, I also want to show you this. Yeah, so what's going on here is the, sh the shrimp is digging, and this is the gobi. So this is a species of cryptocentros. Crypto, I think, I guess it means him, right, in, in Latin. So, and then this, well, too late already, a trumpet fish comes by. Very quickly they disappear. Let's look at this again, at slow motion. So this is a... At a quarter speed. So you can still, where the mouse pointer is, that's where the fish is. Um, the shrimp is digging. Then here comes the trumpet fish. Look how quickly this came. So we actually only had, uh, we only observed in about 20 hours, correct, of video recordings, we only had six uh, predict attempted predation events and no successful predation, which I think is quite a testament to the vigilance of these gophers. So, the, and, you know, like in this case, the trumpet fish did not come in close at um, catching this water stream. So, I thought that was quite interesting. And then what we did, or more specifically what Dana then did, we used a software called Tracker uh, for semi-automated video analysis. So essentially you can load the video and then you just click on the position of the, uh, of the fish and then you know the video advances one frame or you know, whatever you set it to 20 frames, 30 frames, and eventually you will be able to um, uh, reconstruct this, uh, the trajectory of the COVID. Now, uh, the question we ask uh, with uh, the analysis of these recordings is um, how much do the shrimp COVID move around compared to small sand living COVID, which do not live in the so, you know, these answers or these attempts to answer the question you know, is their trade off, basically. Are they, um, are the gobies uh, moving around less? Are they foregoing foraging opportunities because uh, they are, uh, you know, on standing on guard? And uh, the answer was quite a, a clear yes. So, this is a, a, these are three trajectories of three different cryptocentros. This is it's the same species like the one which the trumpet fish failed uh, to eat. Uh, the scale here is in millimeters, so you can see that it's not even in about an hour of observation. It didn't even venture more than 20 centimeters from the bottom. So, you know, very, um, they always start very close to the bottom, which is at zero, zero. And, um, this is a recording of Ambia gobius, which is a solitary, non-shrimp associated gobi, um, where the, you know, there's an arbitrary point, zero, and it's actually even somewhat truncated here, correct? So uh, the, you know, the camera uh, was set up in such a way that the gobi ventured out. So you can see that you know, it's like a multiple of an area covered here, and you know, it's even under this. Um, this is work in progress. It takes a long time to analyze this at the level of detail, which we don't really want to do. But you know, we, we still have some already really good data. So this is a, what this is, is a, it's a cumulative probability. 
So this is the distance from the borough, and this is the percentage of time spent at that distance or closer. So, you know, this um, light blue cryptocentoscope is spent 80% of its time at 80 millimeters of close. Yeah. This scoby spends about 50% of its time at 200 millimeters of close. So basically, it's, it's a histogram where you, where you summate you know, all previous uh, data values so that you know, eventually it converges to one. So you know, this 100% of the time of this fish is spent at something like 520 millimeters of close. So basically, the further these cumulative probability histograms are to the left, uh, are the, the closer the goal sticks to the goal. And at this point, we've only really analyzed one uh, non shrimp associated COVID, but it's by far the one which is the furthest away from the uh, We have a few more recordings of which we haven't analyzed yet. And you know, just by visual inspection of the videos, this completely uh, confirms this. Um, so uh, the, another way of plotting this is like this, that these are the, um, this is the medium of the distance uh, from the borough, and this is the second and the third quarter. And uh, these are the non shrimp associated phobies, so the amblyophobias, you know, a similar sized fish, same fish family, living in the sand, but just no symbiosis with the shrimp. And these are, and then we separated out. You remember there were these two clades in Gobi evolution? And we separated out the reef and the seed uh, shrimp gobies. Both of them start much closer to the center of their territory than these uh, non shrimp associated gobies. But there's also a significant difference between the reef and the seed uh, shrimp gobies. So not only is there a difference between gobies with the symbiosis and about it, but uh, you know, also between the two independent you know, lineages of shrimp goals, there's quite a difference. Not only that, um, yeah, so we, we can um, we can say that you know, the advantage clearly is the support provided. Is the visual system expanded? No. Is the less time time spent foraging? It's a clear yes. Um, we also found quite a significant difference between these two uh, sites which we looked at. And so remember, one was you know the seagrass meadow with a pretty healthy fish fauna, um, and the other one is this coral reef which is basically just unfortunately overfished. And so we did these surveys, you know, transects where we. Uh, checked for the number of you know, fish eating piscivore uh, fishes uh, uh, 5 meters to each side of a 20 meter transect. And the first two times we did that, both done we did find a single fish eating fish in that area. So it, it's, it's a bit um, sad because <laughs> this has been depleted. But you know, it is what it is. So you know, the, the uh, value we got, we got 0.8 piscivores per 100 square meters. Well, in uh, Silaki, the value was 6.7. These are mostly sand perches, which are also known to feed especially on the shrimp, this alpha shrimp. Uh, you know, previous studies by uh, research groups in Japanese have found a lot of alpha shrimp in the stomachs of these fishes. Uh, additionally, there were small groupers, small races, uh, and these trumpet fish and quantum fish. So, um, the, there was a much higher threat level, basically, in Seymour. What, what other differences is there? I mean, it's, it's deeper in Los Cielo, which means that they have a higher pressure. That's not going to be a, a big deal for a fish, uh, but uh, the light levels be much. And we actually have data with um, data loggers uh, where we measured that. We have not analyzed it, but it was quite clear. So in, uh, in Reality, there are really uh, still two possible explanations away for this difference. Uh, that the, uh, the differences between these two sites, that you know, it's darker, 
uh, which, which is, a, is a very big team for an animal with very small eyes, which is a visual specialist. And uh, it's, it's darker and there are way fewer predators. Now, what's the result of this? So this, uh, this again is the mean distance uh, from the borough, and these are the uh, reef shrinkovies. And these are three individuals of sick shrinkovies, which we analyzed in the shadow side. Where, you know, as you can see, uh, on average, there are probably about 50, uh, you know, the mean is about 50 or 100 million millimeters. So, you know, between 5 and 10 centimeters, that's the immediate excursion distance from the origin of the world. Now, when we look at the same species uh, at the deeper side, the few predators, all of a sudden, you know, they're way more active than the main child. So, you know, we still need to double check. We actually have, we also have shallow water data with less and more light because we measure this during uh, sunny weather and cloudy weather. So, so we will actually be able to discern uh, whether it's the predators or the light levels, which make a difference. Uh, we strongly believe at this uh, point that it's the predator density. So, um, Nadia Abesam is a study which I um, originally mentioned was done in fish tanks. Uh, where there were no predators at all. And, and there was a very high level of activity of both shrimps and goldies. So I think it's, it's, it's uh, reasonable to speculate that what these goldies are doing, they're, they're taking a uh, temporal average of like how many threats am I seeing? You know? How dangerous is this place? And uh, you know, maybe maybe it's, it's an average taken over a day, maybe over a couple of hours. Um, and then they adjust the activity. Uh, if, you know, and, and if it's a uh, spot where it's not that dangerous, they venture out for quite a quite an interesting and quite a high level of intelligence rate for very small fish. We made a couple of other interesting observations. You've already seen that in the first video. So this again is a, is a time lapse and look at the, so there's obviously it's the shrimp. This is a species of Amdelia otris. And look at the eye color of this fish. Uh, I believe this is sped up four times. And then the eyes will very quickly go away. Ah, we need to undo the slow mo. See? So, what purpose could that have? Now, you know, this. if you look at some smaller gobi species, they're almost translucent. And um, these, these are uh, huge eyes and dark pigment on the top of the eyes could really limit the stray light. So um, we were initially thinking that this is essentially something akin to like a widening and a narrowing of the pupils in a human. But uh, we then analyzed whether the uh, eye color change actually correlates with a light light. And the conclusion is that it does not. So this is a, an example of a, a data logger recording where this is the uh, illuminance of the sunlight in Lux. And you know this is um this is a fairly sunny day on a, on the deeper side in Lucero. And uh, there are some fluctuations here. And this eye color change happened here. So we, we get the, the light color changes about once a minute. And this, um, you know, the, 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 the red line is the eye color. And that essentially, this happened at a time where there was really not much of a change in light levels at all. So what, what we now believe is that it's a it's a reflection of the mood of the fish, essentially like you know, like a human being embarrassed and having a red face. 
So it's pretty much a social signal, which is, it's a, it's a bit surprising because that fish, which I just showed you, it was fairly alone. So there weren't really any other gobies around it. But it's probably, this is probably somewhat of an unusual situation. So uh, mostly they would, um, you know, they would use this to communicate some kind of uh, internal level of excitement, something like that, to the neighbors. Um, quite interesting. Um, finally, we asked the question, is the whole hassle um, with, the, with the shrimps worth it? So basically, the, like, there's a significant reduction, right? I mean, the uh, foraging area, which these goalies can service, is, is massively reduced. They spend a lot of time essentially stuck to the poor entrance. So, so there must be large advantages. And you know, the, um, we also so you know one way of assessing how, how successful this nevertheless is is we just did a biodiversity study. So we went to all these you know sites, some of them nice coral reefs. Sometimes you know that the visibility was a bit of a shield. And I read up for hobbies. Um, you know, congratulations to Dana for not losing me <laughs> in any of these dives. And what we found, we found 41 species of rules, and of these 18 Russian uh, you know, almost half, and in a lot of the sandy sites, these were by far the most dominant uh, fishes, uh, the most dominant bobies, and you know, the, the density was highest. Uh, you've already seen this on the video, so this is uh, Mesina Bachnare, which had previously only been known from uh, Papua New Guinea, from New Britain, and from Indonesia. So it's it's a new species for the Philippines and actually for the, the northern hemisphere. So it's uh, quite exciting um, to find that. We also uh, correlated the uh, number of shrimp gobies, uh, I'm sorry, just the number of gobies with um, the area which was served, which was about 75 square kilometers. And uh, you can do it, this is called like a uh, species area of range. So essentially you, you plot the logarithm of the number of species versus the logarithm of the area of which you survey. And then there should typically be a uh, straight line through this. Now, Lisa Dunder this in the Prepare Reef, and they found um, 30 species there, 41 species in Bori now. A few years ago, I did a, a survey in, with some um, colleagues in Manapasco where we found 59 species. Singapore, I believe, has six, 159 species. And the Bird's Head Peninsula, which is a large peninsula in the Indonesian part of Papua, uh, has um, 309 species. Um, now it's a little bit tricky, you know, what do you compare, right? Do you compare coastline or area? It's very difficult to compare coastline because it's, it's a fractal issue, right? So the, the more, uh, if, you, if you look at a map at a uh, higher resolution, the coastline is being broken. So it's actually, you know, to compare coastlines, you would really have to have maps that exactly they run the same. Uh, magnification factor, and, you know, so it's not easy. So I think comparing the area is actually it's quite reasonable. It's a good approximation. There's also a difference in the in the you know the type of sampling here. So the Lizard Island study, I think it, it was uh, done with uh, basically using a fish anesthetic, and this bird's head study was a, it was a very thorough study by some really expert taxonomists going over many years. So, you know, we, we will probably find a few more species and convince in Polinao if we look at uh, further. But um, I think we are probably pretty close to that point. So, you know, uh, essentially, what, what is this regression line? It's, it's uh, the, uh, the expected number of species. And uh, Polinao is right on there, which, if you, if you have been to Polinao, again, you know, it's. Uh, Fantastic research opportunities, and especially if you like always, there's amazing wildlife to see. But you know, nobody will really dispute that this is a suppressed piece of ocean. Now, uh, what I think this tells us is that the stress really 
affects the top of the food chain. So, you know, uh, any, has anybody ever seen a shark before they now? Not me. And uh, the, you know, even larger groupers and snails would be rare. However, you know, at this level of fishes, which are just, you know, cryptic, sand living, bottom living, only a few centimeters in length, uh, the, the ecosystem of this level is actually still quite healthy and, and you know, very, very diverse. And, you know, that's a, it's, it's a nice sign that at least the stress has not reached uh, the point of the ecosystem. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, really, many thanks to Cecilia, Patrick, for the good discussions, Dan again, bringing me here. Um, thanks to the boatmen of the lab aids. And uh, these guys were very helpful in the idea of some of the rare movies. Now, you know, normally it's, it's a bit equalized, right, if you can take out the cell phone during a talk, but if you want to take out the cell phone now and I'll look for this you are in. So we got, we got a small, uh, we got a science communication grant uh, a while ago. And we get a Guitino, who is an artist in Tomakete, who is now uh, working on a shrimp gobi cartoon. And so, you know, we, we want to communicate how interesting this symbiosis is to the general public a little bit more. And the setup uh, web page, like dedicated to shrimp gobi, where the cartoon is going to end up, and uh, uh, lots of videos. And, uh, photographs and the, the short review. So please check that out. Uh, okay, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you for questions. I look forward to the for questions. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. Um, if, if you're the shy type, can go to menti.com, type in the code, and type in your questions there. Um, Dr. Steinfeld, I have a question. While I was listening to your talk, I can't help but think of uh, relationships, dating, some sort. So I'm just curious. How do this relationship with the, between the shrimp and the goby start? At which point of their life? Yeah, very good question. So basically, what's happening? The shrimp feeds a borrow, and then the goby it, uh, uses visual cues. So the goby looks for the size of the borrow entrance, and uh, as a secondary criteria, it looks for the pattern on the shrimp. So the Dan and I have been, uh, you know, really looking at the shrimp. The, the taxonomy of the shrimp is very tricky. So there are a lot of species which are not properly described, but, but they're, they're quite different. So some have the like, like striper claws, some have this um, leopard pattern on their claws. So the goal we will first see is that boro big enough for me, and number two, it will check uh, is this a shrimp or not. And uh, the shrimp also makes a choice, but the shrimp doesn't see her. So it's very like much dating. <laughs> well, no, no, well, I guess a little bit. So the, the shrimp actually goes by olfaction. So I guess you know you don't you don't want to date somebody who doesn't yeah. smell. Right? <laughs> so so this is what the what the shrimp does. And uh, so there are 120 species of discoveries. I think a few dozen species of shrimp. And there are many combinations possible, but not all. And it also seems that uh, when the when the deeper one, um, the goalies become less discerning. So they're more right, as the Thompson paper. So they're more happy to work with different shrimp species. So basically that the uh, I guess the vision doesn't work quite as well. So it's, it's quite an interesting process how they find the shrimp. Do we have any questions from the crowd? Thank you for that. Um, I was just going to ask: Are all the gobies, all the gobies, look for burrows, or is that uh, are there specific gobies only looking for burrows? So related to that, um, are there some gobies of the same species who won't find a burrow and will just not have a symbiote? Yeah. So it's out of the uh, thousand eight hundred species of gobies. Only about 120 lifted symbionts. There are few species, interestingly, in the Caribbean, um, which seem to be at an intermediate stage, which um, they would use shrimp borrows, but they would not stick to one shrimp and its borrow, but they would have um, fabric reducing. Uh, 
all the species in the coral triangle are over the centimeters. And um, it's very so there have been experiments done where uh, the researchers would catch these cobies and then we uh, you know they would mark them, catch them with a tool spot and release them. And it's that uh, there are two results of this. So either they will outcompete a borrow owner. So they would find a borrow with a shrimp and just beat up their owner and take over that shrimp. And alternatively, they, they would uh, very quickly disappear. So if these species do not have a borrow, they are probably just not savvy enough uh, to uh, survive on their own. And they will probably be uh, fed on by us, you know, small pieces very quickly. So if these uh, if they settle as a lava and then they don't find a shrimp, uh, you know, probably within a week uh, they will be dead. Uh, a lot of these, you know, uh, gobies are not just the fishes with the uh, among the smallest vertebrates, but there is they also hold the record for the smallest lifespan. So some of these dwarf gobies only live for eight weeks, which is which is crazy short for a vertebrate. And so the shrimp gobies live longer, but uh, they essentially. Um, what I believe what the shrimp does, it's essentially it's a life extension Thank you. <laughs> we have other questions from the crowd. Um, maybe let's, let's um, read one of the questions here. What other marine animals have this kind of relationship? <laughs> so so the, it's actually quite interesting that the, so these alpha shrimps, right? So basically, you remember the, uh, the claws, so they're asymmetric. And they seem to be very symbiosis heavy. So there, there is a, I've, I've, I've read the paper, I've not actually seen footage of that in North American saltmore marshes. Uh, they are in a symbiosis with a crab, where the crab uh, seems to have the role of the bull, and it's the guard, and the alpha shrimp are digging. Even more interesting, that I didn't mention that in the beginning, so there's a, um, these are the, uh, the shrimp, um, they are also in essentially in a symbiosis with their own species, which is uh, they're new social. So um, there are some species of these alpha shrimps which live in colonies like ants, where there's a queen which is uh, laying eggs all the time, and the majority of the colony members are workers. So basically, these shrimp are just for some reason they are they are very keen on cooperating with other animals. So you know that at least you know that these new social colonies, the symbiosis with the crab, and the symbiosis you know two different instances really of symbiosis as with the gold. So that you know that there's something to these shrimps which make them very good partners. Composition of the Gobi. So yeah, we were actually gonna do, you know, many open questions, right? If the Gobi was gonna, you know, next year, uh, going to investigate the uh, the stomach contents as well as the sand contents. So basically, we see them take up a mouthfuls of sand. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, that's all the sand which is on the surface, as well as sand which is dug up. So the, uh, the shrimp would, you know, these boros are about a meter long and tens of centimeters deep. But then there's the excavate being brought up by the shrimp, and then the goby would feed in that too. We've also seen them feed on plankton. So it's basically, you know, crustaceans, worms, uh, minute organic material in the sand. I ask this because uh, I think they probably spend less time foraging because their food is uh, available around them or around their territory. Yeah, that, that's yeah, a very good, very good hypothesis, right? So that the symbiosis went hand in hand with a, a change in diet, that they actually they, uh, need to forage less. Do you have other questions? Yeah, there's another question here. I think you've answered. Is this relationship between a shrimp and a gobi a lifetime relationship? 
what happens when one dies. Yeah, so, so most of the cases it is uh, that, you know, sometimes you see mismatches that you have a really big shrimp and a small goby. So, you know, to me that's an indicative of a case where the goby died and the newly settled um, uh, new goby uh, associated with that shrimp. Let's read, uh, there are three more questions from the Venti. Uh, why is it that the advantage of having a shelter had more weight than being able to forage in a wider area? So, so this is really, it's a quantitative question, basically. I mean, there, there's clearly a disadvantage of the smaller foraging area. But in, uh, you know, just by looking at the large number of individuals and, and species, I mean, the, it essentially must play out to uh, the situation that oro beats a wider area for finding food. Okay. Uh, are the gobies and shrimp species specific? In other words, are there specific species of gobies that are more commonly associated with certain species of shrimp? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So basically, the, uh, the relationship is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, there, there's not one species of shrimp for each goby, so uh, there, there's typically a, a range of uh, gobies for each shrimp, but then there are clear preferences and there are exclusions. So there's some pairings which just don't occur. Which to me really is very odd, because the shrimp species do not um, seem to, to defer, you know, their, their behavior doesn't seem very different. So I wonder whether these are details in the communication system. Okay. And are there other experiments which involve an artificial environment like an aquarium? Are their behave are their behaviors the same? Yeah, so we you know done in, in Polinao by uh, probably about ten years ago, Nadia Bisamis, um Silima now. Um, the both especially the shrimp, but also the gold. Uh, were much more active in these tanks in the complete access of rabbits. So they actually added some uh, rabbit fish, which are mid-sized, small mid-sized herbivores, which the goby probably understood fairly quickly that they are not a threat. And then, you know, there, there was a, an amount of you know, surface activity level of the shrimp, which you never see. And also the goalies seem to have been uh, way more active. So basically, you know, this goes back to this hypothesis which we're getting now, is that there's some kind of temporal average where the shrimp tank goes, well, you know, this is not very dangerous yet in this tank. And, you know, uh, they, they would run around much more. So, thank you for the questions. That's the last question from the Mandy. Do we have other questions from the crowd? Maybe just to to round it off, the, uh, I mean, I, I worked with Nadia on the first study. She was ah, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. So, so the other side of the story is what's in it for the shrimp. Yeah. Right? So so those. that's also a question. If the shrimp is, uh, Nadia's work was shrimp so busy, yeah. taking care of the borrow, yeah. right? Uh, and then you see that it's the one that's most active. So what's in it for the shrimp? So uh, I think the study in terms of potentially for food, in terms of what they benefit, was also examined. Uh, there was, aside from Nadia, so a dissertation by Hildi Napordia. Yeah, I don't, I just don't know if that was published though. But they were looking at, uh, what, what do you call this, uh, the shrimps actually near the seagrass, uh, seem to be using pieces of, uh, of, of, the, of the blades that may be stored yeah. in the barrel. And so there's a lot of hypothesis whether that's like a compost uh, area, whether allowing some uh, the composition, because the, the shrimp would have to eat. If you watch the videos, uh, and there were inside the videos of Hildi also, aside from the ones in the in the in the aquarium that Nadia took, yeah. and they are really very busy. Yeah. Yeah. So so that that so for the students, I'm, I'm glad that you're you know calling the attention there's always two sides of the story so it'd be really interesting to develop a hypothesis on what are the factors that would uh, maintain such a relationship yeah so, so it's almost like in the leaf cabinets yeah uh, 
Okay, yeah, so um, it's a dissertation by Hilde and Corda. Yeah, yeah. We looked at the use of sea grasses. So you'll see some of the other uh, areas where they have the mounds. The habitat in the areas you can has been drastically changed there also. So that's really interesting to look at uh, that previous study. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Last question from the crowd. There are none. Thank you so much, Dr. Tenecta. Uh, Mayor, may I call on um, Dr. Kanako to award our certificate to our speaker. Let's give him another round. Of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, should I grab, can I grab the video? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how. 